Hi, and welcome to Kinesiology 5306. We have made it to week one. This is Ethics and Sport, and this week we'll be giving ourselves an introduction to that very topic. We'll be pulling from two articles from Morgan's text. We'll start off by discussing, in Morgan's introduction, several ways we can frame moral issues. Then we'll give ourselves an understanding of the ways um, these moral issues are played out in normative judgments. We'll also make connections between how morality and community go together. And taking from our second article from Suits and his commentary on elements of sport, we'll be looking at the four elements of sport, and then we'll also consider requirements for the games to be a sport. There's a key perspective I want us to keep in mind throughout the entire term, and I'm going to put it right up front. The key purpose of this course is to challenge the way we think about morals. And then obviously we will specifically apply them to the industry. It's key that we think. We think critically and we wonder about these topics. These are not black or white answers. They require us to think. And I wanna encourage you that throughout this term, we will be doing that. And But I also want to draw your attention to not only thinking about these topics, but why you think the way you do about these topics. I look forward to it. Let's start off with getting ourselves some grounding in a couple of terms, ethics versus morals. In society, we often use these ter terms interchangeably, but I want to give us a little bit of a concrete definition surrounding each of these terms. First, ethics can be this notion of a systematic study. Um, when we think about concepts and we study them, we study the ethics, maybe even, or the principles of them. But that gets us to the idea then that ethics is our theories or principles that help us determine right or wrong. It's our framework. Morals, then, is how we play out or practice. Um, think about it as action. So ethics might be our thoughts. Morals, then, are our actions. So for example, we often have strong thoughts about sportsmanship in sport. Morals, then, will be how we play that out on the field, in tough circumstances, when an official makes a call that we don't necessarily like. And again, for the most part, I do understand that we will use these terms interchangeably, but it is important to get a framework around that. Recall, ethics are our theories or principles. They help us know what is right or wrong. Morals then help us practice that notion. It's action to what we believe or deem to be right or wrong. In Morgan's introduction, he starts off by giving us three specific questions that will help us frame ethical principles. On the surface, these seem simple, but they will be played out throughout the entire term. Our questions that will help us frame ethical principles are subjective, objective, and normative. The next several slides will break down each of those concepts in detail and provide examples. Our first type of framing question that Morgan puts in his introduction is subjective questions. We ask these questions all the time, almost on a daily basis. There's such things as they help us determine uh, personal preference. So for example, if someone asks me, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Well, that's easy for me, it's cookie dough. However, on the same token, asking me to justify my personal preference is silly. So for example, if someone says to me then, well, why is cookie dough your favorite? I don't know, because I like it. It's the same way of me asking you or asking you to justify. Well, why is red your favorite color? Well, that's silly. No, it's not. These types of questions are indeed to get at personal preference. And asking someone to justify these, uh, their response, I should say, to these questions is silly and foolish. We know it's personal preference. Let's move on to our second type of questions. These are objective questions. Where subjective questions don't really have a right or wrong answer, objective questions do. They have a clear and definitive answer. And in our day and age, think Google, I suppose. 
not Wikipedia, but Google maybe. So in this instance, if we, if I asked you, what is the, uh, I don't know, atomic weight of copper? You could go to the Google machine and easily find that. Or in the same token, you could look in the back of your chemistry book at your periodic table of elements and you indeed could find the answer. Objective questions then are typically based on fact and therefore can be found to be factual with some sort of factual reference. Um, hopefully at this point in the ballgame you are recognizing that subjective and objective questions don't really help us get at ethical issues. They're not about preference. And they're not about necessarily a black or white response. But ethical issues are much greater than that, and therefore they should be wrestled with. And that's where normative reasoning and normative questions come into play. Normative questions and reasons distinguish by the fact that they aim not so much as to describe a situation, as we may see in subjective and objective questions, but rather they are designed to prescribe how we should act in certain circumstances. The point of normative reasons is to guide us, to instruct us, to recommend, advise, and evaluate how we should behave. Again, there are no correct answers, and they aren't necessarily black or white, and they're clearly not about preference. In addition, then, we should consider that normative questions or normative issues are best addressed by more supported um, or more thought out responses. So for example, in every presidential candidate, in every presidential election, excuse me, we consider which candidate to vote for. And hopefully those questions are not an issue of preference and they're not necessarily a black or white answer. But oftentimes we determine who we vote for by that individual who is better able to argue the points that we align with. And that's how it falls with normative issues, especially as they apply to ethics and sport. The most convincing arguments then surround those that are best supported with the most thought out arguments. Okay, so let's make sense of some of this. I love this slide because it gives us a little bit of a comparison and contrast. So let's go back and think about those subjective questions. They consider personal preference. Favorite flavor of ice cream, or would you rather play basketball or volleyball? Those objective questions then are those that we could look up and find factual reference. What's the Ohio State University mascot? And or what is the state capital of Texas? Normative questions though, are the ones that will guide our thinking throughout the remainder of the term. These questions provide us a framework to think about it's not a black or white, and it's not a preference. These are those answer, questions, excuse me, that need more support. So for example, should the US provide universal health care? Hopefully it's not a preferential answer. It's way more important than that. And secondly, it's not a black or white answer. Third, should athletes be paid? Goodness, this is a very controversial question that has been in, uh, in the world of sport over the last several years. And that answering it subjectively is not appropriate. And quite frankly, it's not a black or white answer. So normative questions, again, or normative issues, help us get at and determine and address ethical issues. And so the remainder of the term, we will be working on and thinking about these normative ways that we can better support our ideas and our arguments when it comes to ethical issues in sport. How then might one judge normative issues? We're gonna provide some framework for that. There's three ways that we can think about values that help us form these normative judgments. We're gonna address three values, prudential, moral, and aesthetic. And in the coming slides, we'll go through those in detail. One way that we can consider normative judgments is by placing it up against prudential values. These values are concerned with the value we place on our own well-being. It's crucial then not just to consider the short-term immediate effects of our actions on our own well-being, but our long-term effects too. And one that acts without concern for their own future jeopardizes that future and ultimately their long-term happiness. 
So let's go back and think about this notion of should college athletes be paid? And if we are thinking about how, if that may apply to one's own well-being, for someone who is and or was a college athlete, they may have strong opinions about that because that is specifically applied to them. Our second way to frame normative judgments is through aesthetic values. These are rooted in the way that we view the world around us, both kind of that natural world and the human made one, as well as the artificial one. When we value something aesthetically, we consider not what practical purpose it might have or might not have, nor its practical utility, but rather the beauty and grace of it. I think interestingly for many sport enthusiasts, they find its aesthetic value in the world of sport. So for example, someone who is an avid baseball follower might find a team that beautifully executes a double play to be aesthetically valuable. That value comes in the beauty and the grace and the ability to execute that skill. We've made it to our third and final way that we can consider normative judgments. This is moral values. And for some, this is really where the, the rubber meets the road. These values bear directly on our relationships and interactions with others. The concern is with how we should conduct our lives so that our actions do right by others. And it contributes not only to my own well good, but to the good of others. Therefore, we want to take into consideration equal treatment and moral respect that we owe others. This is going to lead us in a couple of slides to this notion of how morality and community go together. Okay, let's sum up these three values that help us address normative judgments. Recall that prudential values are concerned with the value we place on our own well-being. Should I go to law school? And in, that, in answering that question, excuse me, we consider our own well-being. In the same way, we may say things like, what foods are best for my post-race recovery? Again, my own well-being. Our second value, then, is that aesthetic value, and it's rooted in the way we view things. Do you find beauty when a pitcher throws a perfect game? And finally, again, where that rubber meets the road is the third value, moral values. This considers, excuse me, our relationships and interactions with others. So, for example, should Team USA women's soccer team receive equal pay as Team USA's men's team? Should the Special Olympics be aired on national television? All in all, these three values help us address those normative issues and or normative judgments. This discussion of moral values and also normative issues is ultimately going to lead us to this question of how are morality and community connected. The next several slides will help us make sense of that. In Morgan's introduction, he wants to argue that at our core, humans are distinctly ethical beings. And unlike any other being, they have the ability to justify and evaluate those interactions with other humans. Morgan makes this statement, and I think it's important and worth, and I'll repeat it. Moral values are not first person singular. They are not subjective kind of values concerned solely or primarily with self-interested wants and desires. Rather, moral reasons and values are first person plural, intersubjective. They tell us what we have reason to do or to value as members of the community. To sum that up, for Morgan, moral values are much more than just being concerned with me, I. Rather, they are concerned with, or moral values take not only me and I, but put it in perspective of those around me. That's that notion of first person plural intersubjective, that I, while yes, I or me, I have to take that in context with those that are in my community and those that are around me. And that is where we become or act out morals. 
for Morgan, morality and community go together in three different ways. Social sense, that shared point of view, and a recognition that my actions impact others. So first, this notion of a social sense. For Morgan, morality and community go together in a social sense because it is in a membership in a community that we learn to behave morally. So think back on growing up. Where did you learn to behave morally? It could have been in a place of worship. It could have been in a school setting. It could have been at home. And oftentimes those morals were learned in our interaction and membership with that community. The second notion then comes off of that notion of a social sense, but it takes into consideration a shared point of view. Morality and community go together when we, as members of a community, recognize and appreciate the other people in our community. I want to think about a team sense. In a, a team situation, oftentimes, we then learn how we can see and appreciate our teammates' point of view. And that is this very notion of morality and community going together. Finally, the third way is a recognition that at our actions, excuse me, impact others. So members of a genuine community <clears throat> recognize that we can empathize with others' point of view and therefore my actions might indeed impact someone else. So let's go back to our team example. When people are in a healthy team setting, considering where morality and community go together, there's a recognition that each athlete or each member of that community knows and recognizes that the actions of each individual athlete does indeed impact those that are in my community. One interesting thing about this notion then, and we'll talk about it more in the coming slide, it's not natural and sometimes therefore it's difficult to extend empathy to members outside our community. And this is oftentimes where we see morality and community not going together. While in theory, this notion of morality and community going together sounds lovely, the realization is that there is absolutely a tension of this moral behavior, specifically outside the community. First of all, oftentimes we view as humans this notion that ethics or behaving morally goes against my self-interest. Because remember we talked previously, if we're behaving morally, we're not necessarily always thinking about I, but we're thinking about we, or maybe even them, or maybe even us. Second, Society often views this kind of ethics at that very odds with my self-interest. Why should I put you in front of myself? Why should I think of someone else's feelings and thoughts? I want to be the one. And so therefore it leads us to this notion of why be moral? Why be moral when doing so is, is contrary to my own self-interest? Why be moral when it means I'm not putting myself first, but rather I'm putting someone else first? So having started off saying all of these notions about studying ethics and thinking about ethics and principles and ideas, why is it then that we should consider or even study how ethics applies to sport? These are just a couple real practical reasons why we will spend the remainder of this term studying this topic. That's because you as a sport manager and someone who's going into the professional industry are going to deal with these very issues every day. And some of these basic issues that we'll be dealing with include this list below. Uh, racial and gender inequality, cheating, unequal participation, student-athlete concerns, scandals, concerns with the media, sexual misconduct, and or violent behavior. And that list is by no means all-encompassing. Therefore, it's important to know that we have some type of foundation in understanding morals and ethics. So when these situations do arise, we aren't necessarily caught off guard, but we're prepared and have a foundation and are able to handle them. Okay, we finished up Morgan's introduction and we're going to move on to our second article for this section. And this is Suits' article on elements of sport. 
Once we get going on Suits' elements of sport, we may have this question of, okay, how does this fit into the larger context of this course? And it's going to help us answer a number of questions as we go throughout the term, so it's important to get some of this framework. And this is Morgan's uh, quote on Suits. And I think it's important because we will also see that Simon Torres and Hager in later times will also uh, directly relate to Suits' article too. So the, the discussion is that Suits' article provides a much needed definitional account of how sport is to be understood in the ethical analysis to come. At the core, Suits' article helps provide us some framework and foundation for some of the coming arguments we'll have. Okay, let me provide you a brief summary of Suits. Don't be overwhelmed. We're going to break all of this down in just a minute. I do think once we get through all of this, or the remaining slides, this slide is going to be important to come back to. I have a feeling you go, ah, that makes sense. Okay, so Suits says for his elements, and he describes it or summarizes it in the following way. It's to play a game, is to attempt to achieve a specific state of affairs or the prelusory goal using only means permitted by rules, which are the loosery means, where the rules prohibit use of more efficient means in favor of less efficient means, those are the constitutive rules, and where such rules are accepted just because they make possible such activity. That's our loosery attitude. Or it can be stated that playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. I promise in the coming slides we'll make sense of all of this. Okay, so here we go. In summary, Suits believes there are four elements of a game. First, the goal. Please pay attention to these details. Notice the top of the slide is the goal. And that gets broken down into two types of goals, prelusory and loosery. In just a minute, we'll move on to element number two, and that's the means for achieving the goal. Element number three is rule governed. And the element number four is our loosery attitude. Please, please, please pay attention. Each of these areas have components under them. Okay, let's start first with that goal. So the first element of a game, according to Suits, is there's a goal. For him, there's two types of goals. First, pre-loosery goal. This is really easy if we think about it. Don't be concerned. It's defined as the achievable state of affairs. It's throwing the javelin the farthest. It's in the game of basketball, putting the ball in the hoop. Okay, these goals can be described independently of the game itself and can stand alone. So, an example of our javelin, this can be described as making the javelin go as far as the competitor possibly can make it go. In the game of basketball, this could mean that the athlete tries to put the ball in the hole as many times as possible. Okay, that's the pre-loosery goal. The second component of our goal is the loosery goal, and this is always defined in the terms of the game. Therefore, if we're talking about the javelin, that means I have to throw the javelin further than my opponent to win the competition. If we're talking about the game of basketball, that means I put the ball in the hole more times than my opponent to therefore win the game. Okay, so first, let's recap this. First component of the elements of game for suits is there's a goal involved. And there's two components of that. It's a pre goal and a loosery goal. pre goal is, to def um, is defined as that achievable state of affairs. Again, in basketball, putting the ball in the hole. In track and field, it's throwing the javelin the furthest. The loosery goal then is always defined in the terms of the game, and oftentimes that is defined as winning. Okay, we are on to our second element that Suits describes, and this is the means for achieving our goal. And this is described as loosery means. Okay, let's make some sense of this. So, what are the permitted rules of the game to achieve our goal? Okay, so let's go back to the game of basketball. What are the permitted rules within the game that we have to follow in order to put the ball in the hole as many times as possible? It's such things as we have to dribble and pass, we shoot free throws, uh, we play defense, and there's all these types of ways to go about then helping ourselves or achieving the means of putting the ball in the hole. 
And at the end of the day, remember, because our illusory goal is to win, what are the means that we have to do in order to win? Okay, so let's go to our javelin example. I've given you some detail here on that right-hand side of your slide. Okay, so if we're talking about winning the javelin, what are those means that my javelin competitor has to do or to follow in order to achieve the loosery goal? Okay, so for javelin, I have to throw it the farthest, but I have to be within the rules and bounds of the competition. So those rules include that I have to stay behind the designated line and throw the javelin within that designated area. So this is, I know this sounds silly, but this is where I want you to think about this. The javelin competitor literally cannot pick up the javelin and walk it out to the field and throw it in the ground. They're not the winner because they haven't achieved those goals by the means necessary. Okay, think also potentially for the game of golf. The goal of the game of golf at the core is to put that little white ball in the hole 100 or so, 150, 250 yards away by using your clubs. The competitor that chooses to put the little white ball in their pocket and run it down the course and drop it in the hole is not the winner. Why? Because they haven't followed the means for achieving the goal. Okay, so we've got two elements down. We did our goal and now we've done our means for achieving the goal. Two more to go. Hopefully your brain is going. The means for achieving the goal are rule governed. That's where we go to our third element. Okay, therefore, the rules governing the elements of sport is our third element of the game. Okay, we have two types of rules. First, constitutive rules. Second, rules of skill. Let's break down those constitutive rules, okay? Constitutive rules spell out the condition that must be fulfilled in order to play the game. Okay, they tell us what type of means is permissible. Okay, and uh, oftentimes these rules prevent us from using the most efficient way to achieve the goal. Go back to our javelin example. The rules prevent us from taking our javelin and walking it out into the field and tossing it into the ground. The rules in the game of golf prevent us from putting our ball in our pocket, walking down the course, and dropping it, excuse me, into the hole. So make this connection. Oftentimes, these constitutive rules in sport totally put these unnecessarily obstacles in our way. Think about this. In the game of golf, why on earth would anyone put bunkers or trees or turns or any of the sort into the game of golf and why is it then that we would follow have to follow rules to play out of the bunkers or out of the rough accordingly why because those unnecessary rules or obstacles are put in there and we'll learn in a minute because that's what adds to the joy of the game but we have to in many ways follow those kind of unnecessary rules. So make the connection. Constitutive rules often are that unnecessary obstacles and the rules that put into place those unnecessary obstacles. Okay, those are constitutive rules. All right, let's talk about rules of skill. These define playing a game well. So this considers how we might accomplish the game as skillfully as possible. So for example, maybe in the game of basketball, our rule of skill is executing an offensive play out of from the out of bounds. Maybe it's executing a specific defensive scheme in the game of football. So make the connection. Constitutive rules um, define the conditions that must be fulfilled to play the game, and rules of skill tell us how we play the game well. Okay we have made it to our fourth and final element of the game. Please recall our first three elements. Element number one was the goal, and it was broken down to pre-lucery and lucery goals. Element no number two, excuse me, was the means for achieving the goal. That was our lucery means. Element number three we just talked about was rule governing. And we talked about constitutive rules and rules of skill. The last component then is this notion of attitude towards the elements of sport. And this is where our loosery attitude comes into play. 
this person or this attitude is what Suits describes as the attitude necessary for game playing. Okay, so what does this mean? This person or this attitude knowingly accepts and embraces the rules or those crazy obstacles in order to achieve the game. So think about this. Someone that picks up the golf clubs and goes to the golf course to play the game of golf must indeed have a loosery attitude that they knowingly accept and embrace the constitutive rules, which really includes those unnecessary obstacles like the bunker and like the rough, and considers them a part of the game that brings challenge. I want to bring out this point. The loosery attitude, and I'm going to bring this, read this directly from your slide. It recognizes that those unnecessary obstacles in everyday life and occurrences are irrational. It would be irrational for us to put obstacles in our way on our drive, for example, to work in the morning. That would be irrational. However, within the elements of sport, the loosery attitude welcomes these unnecessary challenges because there are few areas in our life where these unnecessary obstacles and subsequent challenges are acceptable. For suits, the loosery attitude is very important and it gives a lot of value to the game of sport. It recognizes that sport offers us this place or avenue that we get these unnecessary challenges and obstacles and we can embrace them and attack them and be challenged by them and ultimately enjoy them. Okay, that sums up suits' four elements of the game. Okay, we have finished Suits' discussion on the elements of a game. Now I want us to think about what does it take for a game to be a sport? What does it take or what's the difference between, say, a game of Monopoly and the NBA? A game of Hopscotch and the NFL? And for Suits, he has four components or requirements that help us distinguish between the two. First, for suits, the game, in order for, a, in order for it to be a sport, excuse me, has to be a game of skill. That is, there has to be skill involved and it can't just be a game of chance. So for maybe suits, this would be the first place that he would say that maybe Playing the slot machine is not a game of skill. He, may, he might argue it's a game of chance. And so the first component then is we have to have a game of skill. The second component for a game to be of a sport is that Sue says it has to be a physical skill. There must be some component of physical skill or the strategic and skillful use of the body. I want us to think about then. I'm going to pose this question. What about esports? I think we could argue they are a game of skill. I think though maybe this is where we would suits would get into question. Is it a game of physical skill? Is there a component of physical skill or is there a strategic and skillful use of the body? That's for debate. According to Suits, in order for a game to be a sport, it has to have the following requirements. And we're on to number three. And his third requirement is that a game, in order to be a sport, must have a wide following. Arguably, this is his most debated. Um, it is this notion that a game has to be more than a fad or fascination uh, in order to be a sport. Number four, in order for a game to be a sport, there must be a level of stability. And let me explain this. This level of stability means that there must be some type of regulatory body or agency that helps regulate the rules and enforces them and ultimately makes the sport stable. This happens in many instances, as, as even as we think about these games that have evolved into sport, for example, that they do indeed have these regulatory bodies that give it um, rules and regulations in order that people may follow them. So summing this up, again, for suits, he believes there are four components that a game must meet in order to be a sport. It has to be a game of skill, 
has to be physical skill, it must have a wide following, and there has to be a level of stability. As I stated early on with our suits discussion, I'm going to return to this slide, and it's that summary of suits' elements of the game. And hopefully, as we look at this, we go, oh yeah, this makes a little more sense. So let's return to this. To play a game is to attempt to achieve that specific state of affairs, that's the goals, remember, pre-loosery and loosery, using only the means for achieving the goal or those permitted rules, that's our loosery means, and we think about the rules that prohibit us from being the most efficient means in favor of a less efficient means, that's those constitutive rules. We also talked about rules of skill there. And where these rules are accepted just because they make such activity possible. That's our loosery attitude. Okay, so at the end of this, remember our big easy way to cap this off. It can be stating that playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. Okay, this brings us to the end of our first lecture week one. We've gone through Morgan's introduction and we've considered normative issues. That will be a key defining moment or concept to take us through the remainder of the term. We've also addressed Suits' elements of a game, as well as those requirements for a game to be a sport. We'll see you next week in week two.